So uh, what is FRAND and why, to understand the significance of um, this whole discussion, FRAND arises uh, because of standardised technologies where you have multiple entities who you want to encourage to contribute their technologies to a particular standard. But obviously those technologies uh, require investment and they will have intellectual property rights behind those investments um, and therefore patents. And the difficulty you then face is if you have a standard where there are patents behind it which can restrict the way it's exploited, that causes a problem. And historically the way that problem has been solved is by the standard setting authorities uh, requiring people who contribute to the standard to make a declaration that they're prepared to license their patents to anybody who wishes to use the technology on fair, reasonable and non-discriminatory terms. The difficulty we then face, however, is having come to that neat solution, what does fair, reasonable, non-discriminatory mean? And that is very much the subject of the Unwired Planet judgment, which we're discussing today. Unwired Planet um, litigation dates back a uh, full three years at the time of recording in April 2017. Unwired Planet brought claims in the UK and Germany in relation to five patents. It selected a number of defendants to assert those patents against. In the UK, those companies were Huawei, Samsung and Google. Um, Bristow's acted for Samsung and Google. And during the course of the following three years, which involved a series of trials on the patents, Samsung and Google eventually reached agreements with Unwired Planet and settled out of the litigation. However, Huawei and Unwired Planet didn't agree on terms. And so at the end of 2016, they uh, had a long trial in relation to this thorny question of what FRAND really means and how, we, how you should calculate it. What we're talking about today is the judgment that was reached at the end of that trial, um, which is the first time that an English judge has really grappled with this difficult question. So I think the first interesting aspect of the judgment for me was the fact that FRAND is uh, enforceable directly without recourse to competition law. Yes, uh, Mr Justice Burse, one of his starting points really is uh, he decides that when uh, one as a patentee makes a declaration to Etsy that you're prepared to license on these fair, reasonable, non-discriminatory terms, that declaration is directly enforceable by, by the world in general really. And therefore, he, he doesn't need, in a sense, to look to competition law to um, adjudicate and, and, and uh, come to a decision on the FRAN basis. Because I think there had been a concern that if you had to rely on competition law, you had to reach, take the difficult step of proving that the patentee had a dominant position. Um, and that there was a concern that perhaps for certain patents that might be difficult to prove. And now speaking as a competition lawyer, I don't perhaps agree with everything about the competitional aspects in the judgment, but I think in terms of practical commercial solution, this is clearly the right way for implementers to be able to have the assurance that they can actually get FRAND terms from a patentee who's declared their patents to Etsy. For me, one of the interesting aspects uh, of the judgment is that uh, Mr Justice Burse is very clear that he thinks that in any given situation, as between any two parties, there can only be one true friend. I completely agree. It is, it is interesting because it goes somewhat against or at least deals with a problem that had been identified at least twice before where um, what happens if both the implementer and the patent holder both put forward FRAND licenses? How does, how does the court or how does a, a, a tribunal resolve which one of those is FRAND? So I think he has come up with quite a neat solution which is to say that there is only ever one license. He doesn't say that it's um, going to be the same licence for everybody. It depends on the facts and circumstances between uh, the patent holder and the implementer. Um, but there will only be one licence, and I think that's an important aspect of his decision. Now, he does acknowledge, um, it was a point that was raised, that, but what about all the other FRAND licences or licences that have already, be, already been entered into? Don't we need to unpick those and have a look at those? And I think he deals with that by his, by his qualification on a given situation. So as between two parties, there will only ever be one friend license uh, and terms thereof. Um, but two parties are, f are free to negotiate what those are. Um, and it's not uh, open under the principles of contract law, um, as, as follows from Etsy, to revisit that question in those cases. I guess if I could jump in on mm. this, I, I think it, thinking about where he came up with the idea that the, there was only one true friend. I mean, clearly it solves a practical problem. 
but it also is based on the evidence given by the experts who were opining on the competition law basis for Friend at the trial. And they were saying that actually the, the reason why there's only one true rate for Friend is because you have to look at the rate before the patents were declared. So he's taken that finding and applied it in a slightly different context, which is interesting, but it, you know, for me it's, it's perhaps a slightly more difficult part of the sort of reasoning behind the judgment. I think one other implication of how he's dealt with this question, uh, if you look at it in conjunction with how he's treated licenses which were entered into before 2013, where he has clearly given greater weight to recent licenses, acknowledging that the understanding of FRAND has evolved in that four-year period, uh, there is, I suppose, a question as to whether those licenses pre-2013 are indeed FRAND or could be attacked on some other ground. So one of the things that Mr Justice Burris was very uh, strong about, I think, and this is a characteristic of his judgment, is that FRAND puts obligations on both implementers and on patentees, and I thought the way he dealt with that was very interesting. Mm. Yes, I mean, he, he makes it very clear that there are two counterbalancing uh, difficulties that have to be navigated. One is that the, the patentee mustn't refuse to license, and he calls that hold up. Uh, but on the other hand, that the licensee mustn't refuse to take a license, uh, and he calls that hold out. Um, and the Frand dance, in a way, is, is balancing those two aspects. Uh, and he's very um, uh, keen to make, to make it clear that there needs to be a fair balance of both parties achieved through the Frand process. But I, I was interested to, to see that he notes that um, that doesn't mean that the patentee isn't entitled to recover some value for their technology being in the standard, mm. which is, uh, I think that's raised some controversy previously. I think for uh, some economists and possibly some competition lawyers, that concept will be a little controversial, but interesting how he dealt with it. And I think the balance between the parties also comes out in the way that he's addressed the rate, because you know he has resolved the different offers by Huawei and UP in a way that really cuts the baby in half to an extent. And you know I think I think that follows through from the fundamental approach he's taken of saying you know yes, although the patentee is the one who has the friend obligations. That Im implies a certain that mode of conduct on the um, implementer. Mm -hmm. So I think another really interesting aspect of the judgment is that um, Mr. Justice Burse has gone on uh, to decide um, in the terms of the Fran license the geographical scope of this license. So the dispute between the parties was whether or not the license should be limited to the UK or be worldwide, uh, and he found that it was worldwide. Yeah, I mean, Huawei took quite a strong approach here for, for quite a long way through the period of the litigation. They were only offering to take a license to individual patents in suit in the UK, which were upheld. And shortly before the trial, they changed that position and they said, actually, we're willing to take a UK portfolio license. But they made very clear that they weren't willing, essentially, to take a global license, at least not um, as a result of this litigation. And the judge has really had no truck with that. He said, you know, you, UP, are, you have a global patent portfolio. Maybe it doesn't cover every country, but it, essentially it covers a good part of the globe. And, you know, if there's a country where there are no patents, then fine, you know, you won't get any royalties for that country. And, and on the other hand, Huawei itself is a, clearly a multinational um, manufacturer of goods, sells its good products all over the world. And so the judge has found that in such circumstances, if you imagine two such parties having a negotiation outside of the court, the, it's inevitable they would have reached a global mm. um, license. And so for that reason, he has found, because he's looking at, he has this unitary concept of friend, there's only one set of terms and conditions that are friend in a given situation. For these parties, that is a global license. Now, while he does make that specific to the parties, I think he does also... I think it does also have some quite significant implications for anyone who is a global implementer or and is negotiating with a global patent, patentee, because now the patentee can come to the English court, find that a patent has been upheld as valid, or get a patent upheld as valid and infringed, and then you know the chances are that the, the court may well be willing to grant mm. a global license, subject of course to what happens on appeal. It is controversial because, as you say, it's it's almost holding a gun to people's head that if, if, you, if you're not prepared to take a global license, uh, 
then you're going to be injuncted in a, a key market. So you have to take a license out of somewhere completely unrelated to that jurisdiction. I mean, it's not only controversial, I think it's surprising, uh, not least coming from, from Mr. Justice Burse, who's heard many of these trials and has in the past indicated that he was not sure that the English courts should declare that the terms for a global license. So people who followed this for a while may find that they need to read that passage of his judgment pretty carefully uh, to see how he squared that particular circle. Yes, because I think he's used the term international coercion before to you know describe this very problem that really it looks very close to what he's now done. Well, I think it's interesting as well because he doesn't actually go so far as to order that those terms need to be entered into by the parties. But as you've said, Miles, um, he's saying this, this, is, this is what you need to do to avoid the injunction, is to enter these terms. One aspect of the judgment that I uh, anticipate will generate a certain amount of debate amongst competition lawyers in particular uh, is Mr Justice Burst's finding that competition law, he doesn't see it as a tool to, to define friend. I think that is an interesting aspect of the judgment. I think it flows very much from the way in which he has identified a species of FRAND which is contractual. And he said it's the Etsy contract and that is something which is separate from competition law. And once he's, he's done that, he's then able to uh, distinguish the route that he takes from some of the ways in which competition law originally began to think about FRAND because the concept of entering into fair, reasonable and non-discriminatory contracts is historically something which has been imposed on dominant companies. And of course he does hold that Unwired Planet is dominant. But in order to get away from some of the difficulties with some of the concepts of excessive pricing, for example, mm -hmm. under Article 102, he said, well, we take those principles, but we say that in this contractual context, um, competition law really isn't the governing principle. But I don't think I would necessarily agree that it's right to say that competition law doesn't assist in understanding FRAND, because I think a lot of the underpinning concepts are very similar. And one of the more controversial aspects of the judgment will be that the judge really hasn't dealt at all, because of his approach, with some of the thinking of the antitrust authorities mm. on what a FRAND writ might be and how you might come to it. So, for example, he hasn't really uh, grappled with what is the true value of any individual patent to the standard. Um, he's he's mm. touched on it, uh, but he's he hasn't really dealt with it because he takes a view, perfectly sensibly on some grounds, that the contract that the company's entered into was not to adopt competition law, lock, stock and barrel. So one of the difficult things that the judge has to grapple with when he's adjudicating on a FRAND dispute is whether all of the offers made at all stages actually have to be FRAND or whether it's only really the final outcome that counts. What do others think about how the judge has dealt with that particular issue? It is interesting and, um, and I think actually on balance it's quite a, a sensible analysis of, of the situation um, and in this case he found that neither party made a FRAND offer um, before he, he found the FRAND terms. Um, and I think that you know that's kind of a sensible approach because one would expect in a commercial negotiation that people would put forward competing positions and seek to negotiate to an agreed position. And um, as long as uh, the parties are behaving in a FRAND way uh, and are not being excessively unreasonable with their, either their behaviour or the offers that they're making, um, then he accepts that the, the, the offers don't need to be friend, and I think that's probably a fair approach. And indeed, that's almost inevitable if you've only got one true friend for a particular <laughs> set of parties. Exactly. So yeah. <laughs> I think that's right, although those of you who remember the Huawei ZTE judgment will remember that one of the controversies that was, um, was caused by the way in which the Court of Justice approached the question of the, the dance mm. between the implementer and the patentee was the requirement that each party must make a friend offer in order to avoid mm. being held to be acting in a non-FRAND way. So looking at that judgment, many people scratched their head and said, well, is it true that every offer has to be FRAND? Or is the court there talking about engaging in a FRAND process? Well, I think Mr. Justice Burris has come down very firmly on the latter point, mm. 
and really has said, no, you're not required to make a friend offer for your first or your second or your third offer as long as you're mm. acting in a friend manner. So that's quite an interesting uh, decision on his part. As long as both parties are sensibly cooperating with this friend approach mm. to, to move towards ultimately a friend license. Yeah. Of, uh, which that you said that, that seems to be his view. Yeah. I mean, I think, that's, I think that's right, but I think what's, what might be interesting is that the contractual obligation is between the patent holder uh, and Etsy for the friend undertaking, mm. and the implementer doesn't have any obligation in that respect. Yet, you know, very mm. clearly the implication is that both parties mm. have to behave in a friend in a friend way. And I think the pressure is on the implementer in that respect to try and avoid being injuncted. Mm. And that, that's the sort of bargaining chip that the implementer has to pay with. Yeah, and the judge is quite open about the fact that, you know, on my planet launched this litigation in order to put to place pressure on Huawei. Mm. So it's interesting that he's then walked away from the competition law cases that really are looking at the, that pressure and the risk that it gives, and the sort of foreclosure risk that it gives rise to. Well, I suppose the $64,000 or even more question that really lay at the heart of this judgment was, well, what is this friend and, and how do you calculate this friend rate? So, Miles, give me your best on that. Well, it's, it's one of those two, two level answers, I suppose. The first level is it all seems pretty straightforward. Uh, you just identify uh, some relevant comparable licenses mm -hmm. and then you unpack from those because he appreciates that each license will be particular to its own circumstance, and that's why he says there's only one level of friend between any two parties. But you, you take what you identify as comparable licenses and you unpack those terms and work out a way of adjusting them to be relevant to the situation you're looking at. Mm. And essentially, that's his principal way of arriving at um, uh, the, the friend rate. And then he, he cross-checks that with what he calls a top-down analysis, which is where he um, decides how many patents exist, essential patents exist for a given technology in the total pool, and then he uh, decides what share of that total pool the portfolio being licensed is, um, and then he balances that against what he sees as a, a reasonable total royalty burden on the overall product. And by working out that share against the total royalty burden, that's a cross-check on what he's deduced from the comparables. So in some ways, that's fairly straightforward as a, a process to describe. Pretty Obviously standard the, from a UK point of view. It, well, exactly. And I, I think people negotiating um, licenses will be well familiar with that. Mm. Obviously, the, the devil is in the, in the detail of it. Which licenses do you identify as, as comparable? Um, and in the mechanics of unpacking and transforming the results from those licenses to the present situation. Again, there's a whole load of, of devil in that. I mean, I think, yeah, one of the key aspects of devilry is this issue of how many essential patents are you really talking about? Because I think everyone, it, it's widely accepted that there is a measure of over-declaration in terms of the number of patents that are declared to Etsy. And there are good, very positive reasons for that, because people want to make sure that they're declaring a patent, even if there's some possibility it may become essential. So it's, it, the, the judge has attempted to identify, based on the party submissions, what the kind of level of relevant SEPs, by which I think he means the kind of really, truly necessary SEPs uh, in the sort of world of um, these standards are. And then using that to establish the share of those held by, in this case, on my planet. But all of that is it, highly fact-specific and it's based on the submissions of the parties. So. Mm -hmm. It's perhaps that's an area where it's perhaps a bit harder to read across to, to the future as to how such things will be assessed. And of course, other parties may put together their own such studies, mm. which will Although, perhaps drive a different result. I mean, he, do, he does find as a question of fact, he actually says on, on the information that's mm. before him, what the numbers of truly, what he calls relevant essential patents were for GSM, UMTS, LTE. Mm. I mean, not, as a non-patent lawyer, I find that a bit peculiar because one of the things I've always understood is that the universe of patents is changing mm. all the time because they have a 20-year lifespan and new ones are granted. So unless you have consistently the same number of patents dying and being born for the same technologies, mm. it seems to me that that genuinely is just a point in time. Mm. 
And that issue did come up in the sense that he was Unwired Planet's methodology was really cut, cut off the number of patents at the point of release eight, so the kind of the fundament of 4G. Yes. Um, and one of the criticisms from Huawei was, well, hang, hang on, there's an awful lot of very significant patents that came after that, so how do we deal with those? And Unwired Planet had, had this sort of so-called 80-20 mechanism for giving them some value. Um, but that that was a point of debate, and it, you know, it, I don't think the judgment is completely definitive on how those mm. issues are going to be dealt with in the future. Yeah, but I think you know, in the same way, it's very hard um, if you take a decision on the point of fact, uh, an appeal to overturn it, because okay. the judge is in the best place to determine those things, and you know, appreciating the limitation of its point in time going forward. Nevertheless, it is a yardstick mm. a- against which you know arguments on this point going forward will be measured against. I mean, for me, it was. Again, this is an aspect where he takes a, a robustly pragmatic view, perhaps is the, the way to describe it. That he, he, Obviously, the parties put forward submissions saying how many totally relevant patents they thought there were. And um, Unwired Planet thought there were about 330-odd. And uh, unsurprisingly, Huawei thought it was a much bigger number. Uh, they thought it was about 1,800-odd. And the judge comes out with a figure that's, uh, that, you know, he, he, he decides what he thinks that each of those parties are about a factor of a two out. So really, uh, Unwired Planet well, shouldn't be 330, it should be 770 odd. And uh, the Huawei estimate ought to have been about 900 odd. So he's got 700, 900, and he decides he's 800 in the middle. So one of the, the basic approaches or uh, Mr. Justice Burse in the case is that he, he decides in the FRAN calculation that all patents should be treated for the, for the calculation as valid and having some value. Yes, all patents within this pool of relevant SEPs that he's established. So he's already done some triaging to kind of get to the point when he says, well, okay, then we treat them all as having essentially equal value. Uh, I mean, although he, he although he does say that, he acknowledges that there may be so-called sort of cornerstone, really fundamental patents that p- might perhaps command more value. And I think the way he would see it, and, I, and I'm slightly reading into the judgment here, but I think the way he would see it would be that if you had such a patent, then that might push up the total royalty burden. But it, looking at the benchmark royalty he's calculated here, I think it, you know each patent is treated as that's treated as average will command the same proportion of that benchmark. Hmm. Now, that, that, that is quite striking for a patents judge to say that, because, of course, patents do vary in terms of what they cover, in ter- terms of what the, how, how significant the technological development was. Are they part of the real foundation of 4G? Well, perhaps if they are, they fall into this special category. But it, there are still going to be particular nuances over particular patents, and it, it's a bit reductive, to, arguably a bit reductive, to say that everything is really worth the same. Mm. And it also to my mind, makes it reduces everything to patent counting. And actually, that's not how licenses, license negotiations work in the real world. The c- companies are very keen to actually look at each other's technology to understand, is it valid? That's obviously one point and essential. But also, you know, mm. how significant is this? How much of a real invention how is this? How much work has the company put into this? Well, it, to me, it was interesting as well, given the, the path that this particular case mm. followed, mm. because we started out with a number of fairly substantial patent trials on specific unwired planet patents where we were determining were they properly essential, were they properly valid. And interestingly, the findings from those cases don't really feature in this judgment. And I wonder whether that's partly just a function of the fact that the parties didn't really advance a case that was based on the individual valuation of the particular patents in unwired planet's portfolio. Mm. And that a different case might evolve differently for that reason. Mm. And I think it, you know, it's still the case, obviously, it was a key part of his judgment that um, in order for the implementer in, in this case to be faced with the threat of injunction, um, we need not only to determine the FRAND license terms, but also establish by this court mm. that there was a valid and infringed patent. So there is necessarily some analysis mm. of, of a finding of at least one valid and mm. infringed patent, um, even if, even if the, 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 the court doesn't go into the details of the relative value of that in terms of the portfolio as a whole. But I, I, did, I, did, I did pick up on your point. I mean, I did, you do get some sense reading through the judgment um, that it's going to be an arms race to get a bigger number of patents in everyone's yeah. portfolios. Yeah. <laughs> so you know, it reinforces the over-declaration problem and then yeah. this triaging to get to the number of relevant SEPs. So one um, 
correlation of perhaps that approach that uh, he's taken with uh, uh, not really focusing on the particular features of a given patent, for me it raised the question, um, does that mean going forward if we have similar disputes, is it, uh, does it make sense for parties to start with friend and establish what a friend rate is first? And then uh, as Rich says, you still would need to prove ultimately that you've got a valid and infringed patent if you want an injunction. But if you start with FRAND, at least the parties know yeah. what numbers they're really playing with. And of course, at the moment, MUP has, on my planet, has appeals outstanding where it's trying to, it's had one patent revoked, so it's trying to reverse that. So, you know, it's unclear whether those things have been taken into account in this counting exercise he's done. Mm. And this question that Miles raised, I mean, this has been an issue before the English court in this type of trial for at least 12 or 15 years uh, as to how, which order you should do patents and brand in. And maybe Mr. Justice Burris has slightly given more impetus to dealing with the patents and the brand thing either side by side or perhaps with brand a little before. So it's interesting. Um, so for a number of years now, um, a decade uh, or more, um, there have been a number of disputes in the UK um, which involve these issues of FRAND. And I think um, until this judgment, we've never actually had a decision of the court on the issue. People have managed to avoid and settle out and avoid the court having to do that. But, you know, a key point in this judgment is that the, the UK court can and will decide what are FRAND licence terms. I think that is a key point. I mean, there have been suggestions more over the last five years or so that courts were beginning to recognise that ultimately someone would need to do this. Uh, there were suggestions in uh, Mr Justice Burris's own judgment in the Bringos NTE case that he would be willing to do it. And some US courts and uh, a Dutch court and a Japanese court have all nibbled around the edges of setting Fran Rich. What I think is, is quite different about what's happened here is that Mr Justice Burris has really grasped the whole thing by the throat and has said, I am going to set a writ for a global portfolio license and the terms for that license. And that, I think, is the very novel thing about what he's done here. I think the timing's quite interesting because, of course, the European Commission is currently looking at even guidance on how you calculate a friend rate. So, you know, in a pre-Brexit world where Mr Justice Burst has perhaps stolen a march on the Commission. <laughs> <laughs> The thing that people often look to when they see a new court judgment is say, so what's the verdict? What's the what are the remedies? And that's obviously particularly interesting in this case. Mm. Yes, one thing the judgment makes clear is, I suppose, the, the role that an injunction would play, which is obviously the classic remedy in a patent action, um, and how that interfaces with the friend obligations. So what uh, what the judgment says is, if you're the patentee and the court determines a friend rate, if you're not prepared to offer a license on those terms, then effectively the court is not going to enforce your patent. And equally on the other side, if you're an implementer and the court determines these are what friend terms should look like, if you're not prepared to take a license on those terms, then you're just somebody who's infringing a patent without a license and you'll be injuncted in the usual way. And of course that was the issue that the Court of Justice was looking at in Huawei and ZTE and the judge seeks to distinguish um, the situation here because he's looking at it from a contractual friend perspective rather than from the perspective where you're using competition law to enforce the friend obligation. But nevertheless you have to wonder whether the sort of risk of an injunction that could force you to enter into a global license doesn't still have exactly the same effect that the Court of Justice was concerned about in Huawei and ZTE. I, I suppose that the judge's thinking is that by the time you've gone all the way through this process and everybody's had access to the court and everybody's uh, put their submissions there and then the court, by definition, has decided this is the fair thing, then you know, there's no, the coercion yeah. element is sort of not there. And, and he does acknowledge that perhaps when... He acknowledges that he might be wrong about the fact that, that on my planet, having started the litigation without having made a first offer, might not actually be a problem under competition law. He says that, that's, that's possibly right. But even if it is right, actually that's now history. You know, we don't need to worry about that anymore because the parties have been engaging in offers and you know, as they've continued the litigation. So effectively that abuse, if it was one, would be cured by continuing to negotiate and, and while the litigation is ongoing. I mean an interesting um, consequence of, of that finding to me is the question about whether an implementer 
um, can effectively always indicate uh, that they would be prepared to enter a FRAND license. Um, and that upon a finding of a valid and infringed patent, they can hold that position right the way until the conclusion of the trial, even if they're putting forward a different offer or refusing even to negotiate. I mean, subject to behaving in a FRAND way, uh, mm. the implementer has quite a lot of lee, lee room to go all the way to the end of the conclusion of the trial and still have that option mm. of accepting the FRAND licence without fear of an injunction. Mm. Well, it does open the box of a, what is the consequence for either party, really, of, of failing to behave in a FRAND way if... By the time you get to the, the court case, there's a, the defined frames terms, and if everybody's prepared to offer and accept, does that effectively wipe away what's happened before? I suppose ultimately the risk is putting the rate that you're going to achieve into the hands of a third party. Yeah. I think also, in, in fairness to Mr Justice Burris, he does indicate that if people act outrageously mm. or are truly intransigent, they really should not rely on his observations in this case mm. as a guarantee mm. yeah. that they won't be injuncted. So I think he has tried to guard a little bit against that. I mean, whether it's sufficient, we'll have to see how future disputes unroll. And one related point that comes back to the distinction between this case and Huawei's OT is what happens to the obligation to provide security that the Court of Justice has said applies to implementers? Because the judge, he refers to it in passing, but he certainly doesn't apply it to this case. So... You know, based on this case, the the idea that you could be compelled to enter into a global license, that is what's threatened, that suggests that that security level could even be required to be at the global level, um, which is, you know, a very major commitment Mm. for a company. It's a tremendous imposition on an implementer. But I thought Mr Justice Burst was very careful um, before he engaged in the analysis of Huawei ZTE to distinguish it on the facts mm. before him mm. and in particular the unique procedural circumstances of litigation in Germany where you have the bifurcated infringement and validity decisions. Which of course we may have for the UPC. Exactly. So one of the issues that was really fought hard by Huawei was the idea that one of the other companies that had originally been involved in the litigation had managed to settle with On My Planet and they'd got a rate that they considered to be considerably more favourable than the rate that On My Planet was offering them, even by the end of the litigation. What, what, what's, what are your views on how the judge dealt with that issue? The judgment on this is not, is not entirely clear in the way that it's expressed, but I think what you can take from it is that Mr. Justice Burris still had in his mind the distinction between contractual Etsy FRAND and competition-related FRAND. And I think, in his judgment, when you're talking about contractual FRAND, uh, what the Etsy members had in mind was the concept that everyone would have equal access to a license on more or less the same terms. And he believes that by setting the benchmark, then as long as you offer the benchmark, that's fine. He acknowledges that if either he's wrong on the scope of contractual FRAND or if you go down the competition law route, then there may be a more precise measure of non-discrimination, which is treating equally situated companies in a different way, and that that might give rise to some concern. But he makes the observation, which is squarely drawn from the competition thinking on this, that if that is to be a problem, then it should cause uh, a competition problem. So it should lead to some failure of competition between the two allegedly similarly (coughs) situated licenses on the market. And he says that in this case, he has seen no evidence of this, and therefore he doesn't go ahead to to deal with it. Mm. But he's drawn, again, quite quite a sharp distinction, I think, between his concept of contractual brand and what competition Mm. lawyers might think about as being discrimination or fairness or reasonableness. Yes, so the way way he sees it, he comes up with a calculation of what is Etsy contractual friend, and then he's saying, is there some other reason that would let a licensee demand something less than that, given that he's already said there can only be one friend? Mm. Um, And I suppose once you start seeing it through those eyes of there can only be one friend, and to, to move away from there requires something extraordinary. That's I think that's the, the kind of underpinning of his thinking, perhaps. Yeah, maybe.